quite a lot of Buick to talk as we kick off Cornelius with our first two-minute uh, go. But has he chosen right in the arc, a day are over Hurricane Lane? It would have been, I think, fairly astonishing if he hadn't uh, gone with uh, Adiar. No, th this is a horse, what was the quote after, uh, he's got all the qualities of a top class middle distance horse, he said after the horse had won the King George. This is a horse that is banging on the door of greatness. Only Mill Reef and Lamtara mm. uh, have completed the treble of the, uh, of the derby, the King George and the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. And, and the fact of the matter is, however much Will, will Buick or, and the team at Godolphin and Charlie Appleby, they are professionals involved in racing. To have that kind of uh, a cachet attached to one of their horses and therefore attached to them is, is, uh, is, is clearly outstanding. So it would have been uh, an, an astonishing decision, I think, if he'd gone away uh, from Adiar and gone with uh, Hurricane Lane. Because, you know, the, f the fact is, when you consider the St. Ledger winners of the last... Uh, half century or so, a little bit more. Riboko's been beaten in the arc. Najinsky, Crow, Sun Princess, User Friendly, uh, more recently Kingston Hill. They're all horses who run really well in the arc, have run really well in the arc having won the St. Ledger, but the fact is they haven't actually bridged that gap. And that gap is still to be bridged. And we'd, we're not actually 100% certain that the horse will take part yet, are we? Uh, but uh, we imagine there's a, a very good chance. And let's hope they do, because as Christophe Soumillon said on the programme earlier on, there is is nothing like, as he put it, a three years old uh, having a go at uh, older horses in the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. So, yeah, that uh, is very much expected uh, and um, no, no doubt at all that Adéa brings a really interesting dynamic to a really in, interesting Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. In 15 seconds and no more, mm. is there any, I've asked William Booth this a few times, is there still life in this Jockeys Championship yet? Well, I think there are 11 between them. Uh, it's just the striking thing about uh, about the championship is as uh, Will, M William makes a few steps forward, Oshin does as well. So yeah. it's going to be very hard to bridge that gap. But, um, you know, we've got, what, three weeks? Is it three weeks yeah. to go? Tony Hind is uh, confident he can do it again, as, uh, of course, he should be and would be. Uh, is it going to be Japan's arc this year? It's not impossible. Chronogenesis and the pre winner, Deep Bond. Mm, chronogenesis uh, in particular. Really striking with talking about Oshin there. When was Oshin booked for this ride? Felt like, you know, it's one of those rides that for, for months everyone's known that uh, he would be on uh, chronogenesis in the race. Uh, good win at Hanshin in Japan uh, last time. Uh, that uh, that narrow defeat by Mishrif, uh, r a really striking part of it. And, you know, talking about dynamics when it comes to the arc, there are plenty of dynamics. There are the, the Godolphin three-year-olds. There is Snowfall. There is probably Love. There's Tiona having won the other day uh, at Longchamp. And there's obviously Tanawa uh, having, uh, uh, having uh, run so well at uh, Leopardstown and been so touted. And it's striking. Uh, I've heard two... Uh, jockeys who'd be considered pretty good judges speaking in the last 24 hours. Jamie Spencer on this programme and Frankie de Tori yesterday, both of them uh, honing in on, in Frankie's case, Tanawa as the big danger mm. as far as uh, his the opposition to love and the rest are concerned. Jamie Spencer immediately, I think, coming up with Tanawa when you asked him what he'd love to ride. Going back, Having to said that, when I spoke to Asheen Murphy earlier in the week and said to him, who do you think your biggest danger is? He said, without doubt, Adair. I mean, without right. any shadow of a doubt. Yeah, well, uh, uh, as far as the Japanese, <laughs> uh, as far as the Japanese angle is concerned, uh, uh, the, the, it, it would be, it's an amazing story, really, that, you know, I think there's been this tradition in Japan of people liking to come uh, on holiday to France at this time of the year. That's where they really got in to really getting, uh, to going to Longchamp races, uh, enjoying the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. So it's become this holy grail. And it's a great quiz question. Four second places in the arc by... Uh, uh, three different okay, uh, horses. I'll, I'll tell Go you, Fevre was the heartbreaking one. I was there that day working for a kid. And, and runner-up twice. Runner-up to uh, um, uh, El Condor Passer. Caught very close home uh, by Monsieur. Uh, a deep impact was third, so that doesn't count. Nakayama Festa, well, Nakayama beaten Nakayama by Festa. Workforce. And there have been uh, been third places there with um, uh, with uh, deep impact. Mm. Fourth, fifth and sixth. You know, there have mm. been so many near misses. And the enthusiasm will be behind. And YouTube will be ready, if it's uh, going to be tight in the closing stages, to see the delight <laughs> turn to despair amongst the Japanese fans, who will be up in their thousands in the middle of the night in, in Japan. Talking of... Um uh, no, I miss, I'm, I'm, I'm going one down. Shortages is what I want right. to talk about next. Um, could this fuel 
shortage have a significant impact on racing over the next few days? Well, you, surely will if you can't fill up your horse box with diesel, and diesel has been in shorter supply than petrol. Yeah, I think there was something similar in 2000, uh, and there was uh, there were queues out of service stations and garages in the same way as there are in parts of uh, Britain at the moment in 2000. I remember rim ringing Jim Goldie. It was around the time of the Western meeting at Air, ringing Jim Goldie and said, are you going to have any problems with the fuel? And he said, from where I am to Air, I could let the handbrake off and I could probably <laughs> glide there. Uh, of which uh, he's obviously done lots of times gliding into the winner's enclosure at air. So th there must be a potential issue. Presumably, uh, if you're a, a racing stable, you have your own supply of diesel in the, or quite a lot do, I know, have their own supplies. But uh, at some point, th there must be a little bit of concern. But talking of shortages, you know, staff shortages on, on race courses uh, has been striking. Race courses have been, I think, sometimes a little bit reluctant to talk about them. But at air the other day at Perth this week, I know that there were uh, uh, certain things had to be done at Redcar, uh, the management there. Uh, and it wasn't a case of sort of turning people away necessarily, though they did limit the crowd at, uh, at air on Air Gold Cup Day. At Worcester this week, uh, the, the management, uh, Rebecca Davis, who is the executive director of Worcester and Hereford, she was meant to be having meetings and, and glad handing sponsors on whichever afternoon it was, Friday afternoon. She was rolling up her sleeves and she was pulling the pints uh, and she was keeping spirits up as well because the queues were getting quite long. So she was having to do a bit of humouring of customers and humouring of staff as well. They were looking at these queues and thinking, how are we going to cope? So the, the fact is that you have to that you have to make do, men to make do, uh, and that is what what is having to happen. But clearly it's in ev everybody's uh, minds at the moment. As I've got 18 seconds to go, can mm. I tell you uh, a joke that I've just received? And yeah. uh, thank you. Which Spice Girl can still get fuel? Is this, a, is this suitable for a family audience? Yep. I don't know. Jerry can. <laughs> Luckily, this tumbleweed has no more time. <laughs> Matt Hancock, <laughs> what's he been up to this week? Well, he's been a constituency MP, and he's been uh, a strikingly good constituency MP. You've seen uh, the viral MP. video from last night of you with him going around the constituency. Yeah, yeah. and uh, plenty of uh, glad handing. Because hand hand uh, he, he, he's the MP for West Suffolk, which includes Newmarket. Mm -hmm. uh, he is no longer Secretary of State for, for Health and the other things that went uh, with health. So he is a, a backbencher now. There has been a move within his constituency to, to deselect him. Uh, I'm not sure in a in a true blue part of the country like West Suffolk quite how how uh, uh, effective that is likely to be. But what do you do if you're a constituency MP and you're on the back benches and you're trying to relaunch yourself with a relatively soft matter, not soft, soft to the racing industry, but soft in terms mm. of parliament. You don't go in there and say, look, Secretary of State, um, the, the new Secretary of State, uh, this is this is what you should do. You go in and talk about an issue which is really important to your constituents. So horse in, racing, it, ho horse racing, which is cr is crucial to to a, a large proportion of his constituents uh, who vote for him and I, I think uh, fund him as well. So therefore, that, so it was an important thing for him to do. Uh, he he didn't make any. Uh, revolutionary points, particularly he pointed out how important racing is to the economy of West Suffolk and indeed to Britain. Talk, w talked about the heritage of it. Talking, talked about uh, how funding might work, how the bookmakers yeah, what, what, funding. Surely, models. what he's done significantly, uh, Cornelius, is he's put this subject of levy reform back on the table in front of government. And he's put it back there in front, crucially, of the new minister. Mm. So the reshuffle the other day meant a reshuffle in the Department of Culture, which oversees racing and gambling. And uh, the minister who had been responsible for that uh, went to a, a new job, new Secretary of State as well. But it was really striking. Chris Philp, who is the uh, the new minister, uh, was uh, very polished, which he has a reputation of being very polished. Uh, he said all the right things. He certainly didn't say anything that would be particularly discouraging. And I thought what was also striking was a number of backbenchers that I don't normally associate with racing and interest in racing got up and actually made comments as well. So it was definitely a positive for racing. OK, let's talk about the uh, potential takeover. The US um, giant uh, DraftKings has uh, tabled a bid of, I think now it's, it's working towards 23 billion. It's certainly over 20 billion for Entain, the parent company yeah. of Ladbrokes Coral. What is this likely to mean? Well, and, and this is the importance. The, the fact that big business is going on and people are talking in boardrooms about 
uh, mind-boggling amounts of money. It's obviously important uh, as far as brands are concerned, but what is going to be the effect uh, in, in the UK? And on the one hand, you think to yourself, right, uh, so people are talking about all these billions and uh, Americans are involved and this, that and the other. But, but what it is is that uh, DraftKings, um, which, are, which, which is a, a massive group, wants to be right at the front of everything in the United States, which is an enormous... As, as sports betting becomes yeah, liberated. And, and this isn't just a cake. This is a gatto of enormous proportions. <laughs> Regulations uh, in America have been eased, so it's uh, that, mu- that much easier to encourage people to, to bet where they want to and people who want to have a bet to, to have one. It was been, the restrictions have been pretty astonishing until relatively recently. Now, the fact is that uh, the, the technology which is employed by... Uh, Entain uh, will be of great interest. The cash flow which will be helped by Entain will be of great interest. Things like betting shops in high streets around Britain and Ireland may not be particularly interesting. So we do know that, um, you know, we, we saw when all the betting shops closed um, because of the pandemic that, uh, you know, and I'm sure you're the same as I, as I am, that, you know, when you used to sort of stop off because you suddenly thought, oh, it'd be co- quite fun to go and look at the odds of whatever, I'll go into that betting shop. Or in fact, in my case, if you know that all betting shops have loos, so you run into the loo sometimes, <laughs> having parked on the singular yellow line outside. <laughs> it's quite striking how many of those bet- betting shops haven't reopened. Uh, and uh, there must be further question marks about uh, about betting shops and about how much more betting in Britain and Ireland and across Europe will go online. OK, um, a pre-race testing has now been rolled out in Ireland. Mm. This is a mainly pre-race testing for levels of um, TCO2, so uh, uh, increased carbon dioxide levels in the blood, yeah. so testing for milkshaking, yeah. which is a, a tube down the throat, so increased bicarbonate to... Um, uh, increase yeah. uh, to to, to uh, negate the the build up of lactic yeah, acid. Absolutely. Well, th- thanks for the the science lesson, which is a, an important part of is the it, uh, it, of the whole thing. In fifteen seconds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Uh, but uh, no, the, the 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 fact is that any form of testing which is ma- is um, ma- makes the, the the whole the regulations and the rules and the opportunities to to um, do misdeeds m- makes that harder than clearly is is a positive and uh, it <laughs> no pun intended uh, but uh, you know th- th- that will mean that those type of short term um, uh, potential uh, ways of making your horse go quicker, uh, you know, and th- there is a suggestion with milkshaking, it goes in and it gets out of the system very quickly and it's very hard to detect. And there's that- always been a suggestion that if you do it, you can mask other substances that may be in the system as well. Yeah, a- absolutely. And that is going to be much more difficult to do. I think at Punchestown and Listowel, uh, there have been examples of this. Uh, it was striking to hear trainers like Willie Mullins and, uh, and um, I can't remember who, uh, Joseph O'Brien, I think, saying, you know, it, it was pretty straightforward, didn't cause any uh, hassle. Uh, the, the officials got on with it, uh, you know, and uh, the uh, uh, regulatory board, which uh, has been under a little bit of pressure. This is a, a really strong, uh, positive uh, step from its point of view. It acknowledges that if you're going to do more of this, you're going to need more people to do it. So that is something, you know, hopefully when shortages are discussed on this programme in the future, that won't actually come in as a possible shortage. But that, that is a potential issue. However, you know, it, in terms of the the reputation of racing uh, across these islands, uh, it's, a, it's a really good thing. And I'd, I'd, I think in a few months' time, people will be wondering, you know, why it hasn't been happening for years? And the man who is in charge of racing in Ireland at the moment, Brian Kavanagh, is uh, stepping down or has just stepped down yeah. to make way for Suzanne Eade, who has been the financial co- controller of Irish racing for the last few years. Brian moves on to a, a new role as chief executive of the Curra Race Course. Yeah. So he'll still be a very powerful figure in Irish racing. And he's been a, a very powerful and successful figure in Irish racing for for a very long time now, hasn't he? And what he's he, the only holder of his of his current post, uh, absolutely, or the so, post he's so, just vacated. Uh, yeah, he's been the only and uh, he's a really he's a really interesting guy as well because he's sort of not just in terms of Irish racing and indeed uh, British and Irish racing. He's got such a a grip of horse racing, uh, full stop, and and how horse racing works and. Uh, 
how it works in in Europe, how it works in America and right across the world. The other thing that he's been, which is very striking, is been as well as being uh, an effective, uh, and I think, an effective administrator. Uh, not not everybody involved in the administration of Irish racing has got uh, good notices in recent years, but I don't think he's had very many bad notices. And uh, and his relationship with with government uh, has uh, in Ireland has been really striking. And whereas uh, in in uh, Britain the BHA can probably go and knock on the door of Chris Phillip or even the new Secretary of uh, State Nadine Doris and hope for an answer at some point. Clearly in Ireland, where there's, uh, it's much more integrated with government, uh, that um, he has been very deft in making certain that the case has been put. I think he can practically, I don't know he can ring the T-shirt, but I imagine he can nearly ring the T-shirt or certainly ring very powerful people and, and have a chat. And his diplomacy and uh, the effectiveness that he's shown in this role for a long time has been really striking. And, uh, you know, he takes over from the Curra, uh, the Curra and the Curra had uh, a tricky time. Pat Keogh, who did a wonderful job at Leopardstown, has done a terrific job at the Curra, has really uh, set it up very nicely for, for Brian to grab that baton and to run on with it uh, in, in the future. Yeah, good luck to Brian Cavanagh and good luck to Suzanne Ead, his successor. At and HRI. good luck to Pat Keogh in retirement. All of that, mm. all of that. Uh, uh, the national hunt season is not a million miles away. Well, it never stops, really, does it? But, no. I mean, the meaningful bit of the national hunt season isn't a million miles away. Uh, a couple you meaning of... racing at Worcester on Friday wasn't meaningful. Absolutely. How, how dare you? I mean, the most notable thing about Worcester on Friday was Rebecca Morgan pulling the pines. Yeah, well, um, yeah. 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 Okay, so blow to the national hunt season. Monkfish and Min. Uh, Min retired. Uh, honourable retirement. A veterans. very honourable retirement uh, at the end of a, of a glittering era for uh, well for for the horse within a, gl a glittering era. Monkfish. Um, that's a that's a, a that, big shame. Yeah. And, and and hot on the heels of the news of top of the game. Yeah. And that, that'll be a third season on the sidelines for him for Paul Nichols. And do you remember similarly when, built steeplechaser? Do you remember when top of the game was uh, successful at the Cheltenham Festival? Yeah. At the, the RSA and Just. one thought. <laughs> it's quite. But one thought at the time. This really. Strong striking looking horse was going to really go to great places guided by a perfect person to guide the horse in Paul Nichols be part of that uh, team so uh, he he recovered but he's recovered from his injury but not sufficiently for him to go back into training I was quite struck actually Paul Nichols clearly not surprised this was going to happen um, because he has so much experience of horses now uh, and so he started uh, getting him going he hoped for the for the new season and then has had to pull stumps because that wasn't going to work but not only is this clearly a very talented horse, but uh, th this is a talented horse which is young enough and has enough uh, sort of future, a potential future in front of him for, for the Nichols team not to just sort of throw up their hands in horror, but to, to keep on going. And, uh, you know, th he's come up with many good challenges over the years, uh, Paul Nichols and team. This is going to be a big yeah. challenge to get him back on the track. But if, en if anyone can, he probably can do it. In terms of Monkfish, well, you know, everything has gone, everything went so smoothly with him, didn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, he was the most exciting young steeplechaser many of us had seen for a very long time. We're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we see him. But I dare say absence will make the heart grow fonder when he does come back in a, what, a year? a year and a bit's time. And those were this week's Talking Points.